I've been thinking about the phrase, the perfect is the enemy of the good. The basic idea behind the saying is that while the perfect may be perfect, it's also unchanging and stagnant. While the good is good enough, you're not perfect, but you're improving every day, and therefore you're getting better. This idea makes sense if you understand that human beings can't actually ever obtain the perfect. This idea has been expressed many times in many different ways, unrelated to Voltaire's own formulation of it. Classical Greek philosophers talked about the golden mean, which is the idea that any virtuous quality taken to excess is no longer virtuous, and that moderation is what gives a thing its virtue. A commonly cited example is the virtue of courage. A deficiency of courage is cowardice, but an excess of courage is recklessness. In computer programming, there's a similar saying, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Consider the possibility that it will take you three hours to program a task into a computer. However, it will take you six hours to program a tool that will automate that task repeatedly. If the task had to be done 10,000 times, it makes complete sense to spend the extra time making the tool and then simply have it run while you do something else. However, if you only have to run the task once, you might as well just manually program it for three hours rather than making an automated tool for six. There's a similar problem in spaceflight. If human beings wanted to reach another star system, would we launch a ship right now with our current technology, going as fast as we can make it, with a bunch of frozen embryos and a computer system designed to manage a colony and basically grow those embryos into humans? Or do we wait 100 years when maybe the ships are faster and the computers would be much more sophisticated? Sure, we could begin the task right now, but it would seem like adding that 100 years of prep time would, in the long run, save us a lot more than 100 years of work in actually completing the task. Or consider you're playing a video game, and you have to fight a really hard boss. Maybe you can run in and destroy the boss right now. Maybe you need to go and grind levels or collect materials or something. And maybe at some point you overprepare, so that extra time is kind of wasted. At least in terms of that specific boss fight. The point is, you can definitely draw a parabolic arc between the amount of investment made and a payoff. On the one hand, you have the complete and total failure of the enterprise because you failed to prepare. On the other end, you have so much time wasted in preparation that it doesn't matter that you actually won. You have a victory, but it's become inefficient. This is also, by the way, the same argument that you can make for lowering taxes actually increasing tax revenue. For example, if something is taxed at 100%, well, in that case, maybe a large chunk of the population can't afford to buy that thing regularly, and so sales of it go down, and so tax revenue goes down. But let's say you tax it at 20%. Suddenly, sales are up. And as long as sales go up by more than five times, which is a definite possibility, then the government actually collects more tax. Because even though they're only getting 20% as opposed to 100, that's 80% less tax the consumer has to pay, which means that they can afford to buy more. So on that same arc, there's definitely two extremes. On the one hand, there's no taxes and the government ceases to function. On the other hand, things are taxed too much and economic activity slows down because people just can't afford it. And in the middle, there's that sweet spot where taxes are low enough that people are buying a lot and yet they're still high enough that all of those individual purchases that wouldn't have existed if they were too high are generating even more taxes for the government. This is also known as the Pareto Principle. Vilfredo Pareto was an Italian economist, and one of his hobbies was growing beans. He realized that no matter how many beans he planted, it was 20% of them that actually produced usable crop, and the other 80% produced either no crop or only enough crop to replant and not enough to eat. And then, of that top 20%, another 20% produced an even more disproportionate amount of harvestable beans. And this doesn't just apply to crops. It applies to the population of cities as compared to the countryside. It applies to the distribution of matter in our solar system. It applies to income inequality. It's also mapped out by the Fibonacci sequence, which is basically a series of numbers where each entry is the sum of the previous two entries. Mapping this out into a spiral pattern creates that weird overlay you often see on top of artwork and photos, meant to describe something aesthetically pleasing. It's also what you see when you cut a banana in half. It's also the pattern in which your hair naturally grows. If you shave your head and look at the crown, you'll see it spiraling outward. It also describes the movement of flowers as they grow and twist. In short, this idea, this natural inequality, seems to be baked into nature in everything. In biology, in physics, in sociology, it's something that on some fundamental level we can't escape. And it does cause us serious problems. If a society becomes too unequal, then for all those masses of people who are stuck with literally nothing, they have nothing to lose. And to them, Destroying everything might be a better shot at getting ahead than working hard. And that is something that we do have to avoid. So yes, all of these various principles and ideas, they do describe the 99% and 1% divide. They also describe the idea that 1% of the 1% holds 99% of the 1%'s wealth. 
as well as 1% of the 1% of the 1%, holding 99% of the 1% of the 1%'s wealth. It's not just that the 1% are this monolithic class of hyper-rich people. It, in fact, keeps going upward. However, what this view of economics fundamentally lacks is time. For example, half of all American citizens, roughly half, I think, have a very high chance of entering the top 10% for at least part of their life. 40% of all middle-class people in the United States will be in the 1% at least for one year. The 1% is not this unchanging class of bankers and fat cats. It constantly churns. People drop in and out of it all the time. And when you add time to the equation, you realize that not only does the Pareto Principle or the Fibonacci sequence or anything else that describes the fundamental inequality baked into existence, not only do those things describe classes, they also describe you at different stages of your life. There will likely be times where you have nothing. And then there will likely be times where you are wildly successful in at least one thing. But how does all this relate to the idea of the perfect being the enemy of the good? Well, within the Fibonacci sequence, the perfect is infinite. And as we all know, no mathematic sequence ever reaches infinity. At the end of the day, achieving absolute perfection is impossible. And therefore, at some point, increasing effort results in diminishing returns. And continued activity becomes more and more inefficient. This is described by another old proverb. The journey is more important than the destination. If the destination is perfection, and the journey is being good, then it doesn't actually matter that you will never reach perfection, because as you continue on the journey, you will get better at whatever it is you're doing. This even applies to me. It's better for me to do one video a day, even if some of the videos are kind of bad, because I get better at my craft by doing them. If I spend months and months and months working on the perfect video, it's never gonna be perfect. And those months were spent with no content. Sometimes, yes, you do have to set aside time and make a big project, that happens. But rather than focus on making something truly superb, it's better to constantly try and fail and improve, because that leads to mastery. In the realm of politics, this is the utopian's fatal flaw. Anyone who believes that they can create the perfect world, whether they're religious and looking to heaven, whether they're communists or socialists, and looking to build the perfectly equal world where no one suffers, whether they're fascists or Nazis, and they want the perfectly ordered state, they're all committing what is called the Nirvana fallacy. They create a false dichotomy that presents one option that is clearly more advantageous than the other option. However, the problem is that the more advantageous option is technically impossible. This is what you get, for example, when a communist says that their theoretical idea of what communism is, or should be, is better than the capitalism that we have on the ground today in the real world. Well, sure, anything that you theorize is certainly going to be better than reality, but that doesn't mean that the theory works. It's fundamentally a choice between one realistic, achievable possibility and one unrealistic, unachievable possibility that could, in some way, be better. The ideal is always going to look better than the situation you find yourself in, but that doesn't mean that the ideal is realistic or achievable. Again, to go back to computer programming, they have another phrase, worse is better, where basically the idea is it doesn't matter if your software is technically better than other software. If it's not easy to use, it's not going to catch on. Sometimes things are better because they have less functions and therefore they're more streamlined. But what happens when some kind of extremist, whether they're a communist or a fascist or, or a religious zealot or any other kind of extremist that could exist, what happens when they get caught up in this, when they abandon the good for the perfect? They ignore the tangibly good, humble things they could do around them to make things a little bit better and instead aim directly for the top, the perfect, the ideal. Well, firstly, things have to be purified. That's the source of the purity spiral. Anyone and anything that is not in a line with perfection itself must be disposed of. Thankfully online, that's just deplatforming and depersoning. But in real life, it's consistently led to mass killings. Once they've created this hypothetical pure space that will never actually exist, they then expand the space outward to encompass all of reality. So that not only does the utopia exist, but nothing other than the utopia exists. This is why, for example, in the political doctrine of fascism, Mussolini writes that everything must be within the state, nothing must be outside the state, and nothing must be against the state. It's also why the communists claim that communism will never work and will never be true or real unless the entire world is communist. But perfection itself is also stagnant and unchanging. Therefore, it must always have been, and it must always continue to be. So any of these people, rather than admitting that they changed, they erase history. This is why you see a lot of people, for example, disavowing their old edgy pasts. Whether it's Eddie Murphy saying that it was a different time when he made those gay jokes. Or any of those people that I mentioned in my Who I Miss video. People that I used to know, or at least used to look up to. Content creators, animators, artists, YouTubers. 
who 10 years ago would make edgy jokes and now do nothing but virtue signal on Twitter. It's why you get both ISIS and other Islamic groups destroying both secular artwork and the religious figures from other faiths because only those things that are Islamic must be allowed to exist. It's why you get the radical left wanting to destroy statues of Confederate generals, or change the names of universities or other institutions. David King, in his book The Commissar Vanishes, talked about how the Soviets did this as well. Photos of Stalin and those around him were routinely doctored after the fact to remove people who had fallen from power, as if they never existed at all. And of course, with the Nazis, we know where this ultimately led. The ethnic cleansing of the Jewish population was actually considered to be a cleansing. It was, in their eyes, making Germany clean. And the line of logic, should the Nazis had been allowed to exist for longer than, say, 12 years, would have gone from Jews can't exist in Germany, to Jews don't exist in Germany, to Jews never existed at all. And, of course, I would be remiss in not bringing this up. It's also how you get that crazy we was Kangs logic, where you get those absolute brainlets out there who think that the Vikings and the Celts were, were black for some reason. That's right! If you're siding with the perfect over the good, then regardless of your political persuasion, you will inevitably find yourself trying to rewrite the past. The past is problematic and it must be erased, which is what makes it all the more scary when you hear, for example, Britain's Supreme Court claimed that Parliament was not prorogued. The decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament was unlawful because it had the effect of frustrating or preventing the ability of Parliament to carry out its constitutional functions without reasonable justification. This court has already concluded that the Prime Minister's advice to Her Majesty was unlawful, void and of no effect. This means that the order in council to which it led was also unlawful, void, and of no effect, and should be quashed. This means that when the royal commissioners walked into the House of Lords, it was as if they had walked in with a blank sheet of paper. The prorogation was also void and of no effect. Parliament has not been prorogued. It is one thing for the Supreme Court to disagree with the prorogation of Parliament, for them to use whatever powers they have to reopen Parliament and to end it being prorogued. It's another thing entirely for them to say it was never prorogued in the first place. Or, on the other side of the pond, consider Nancy Pelosi saying that Trump was not acquitted, even though he obviously was. Besides here, but he was acquitted, his poll ratings are high. It, it, there was no the acquittal. You can't have an acquittal unless you have a trial. And you can't have a trial and you have witnesses and documents. So he can say he's acquitted and the headlines can say acquitted. But he's impeached forever, branded with that and not vindicated. Yes, Trump was impeached. And yes, he was acquitted. But the past must be rewritten. Reality itself must be denied. That was, in fact, the core of the issue in the UK and the US. A second referendum was desired on Brexit so that it could overwrite the first and pretend like it never happened. Trump's impeachment went forward rather than simply trying to oust him in 2020 using the democratic process because his presidency, his candidacy, his victory must be erased. In both of these situations, rather than the left dealing with reality as it is, and devising a better plan for them to move forward, which would be, by the way, pursuing the good. Instead, they have to cancel out everything that's happened, which is fundamentally pursuing the perfect. The perfect is the enemy of the good, because the perfect is the domain only of the ideologue. The grounded, rational person will still have an ideal, but will understand that he will never reach it. That's not an excuse not to try to reach it, though, because in the trying, you become better and better over time. Yes, on some level you have to accept that the world has fundamental inequality in it, and that it's not going away no matter how hard you try. However, that doesn't mean that everything's lost, because the timeline of your life also has fundamental inequality in it. A 40-year-old certainly is not the same person, nor is he in the same place as he was when he was 30, or 20, or 10. The good allows for incremental improvements over time, but the perfect is perfect, and you are not perfect, nor will you ever be. So if you're smart, you won't be a perfectionist. You'll pursue incremental improvement over the ideal. You'll value being better for the benefits it brings you. Benefits that perfection can't provide because perfection assumes you already have them. And if you don't have them, well then you're not perfect and you need to be purged. Anyway, that's my thoughts for today. Don't aim to be the best person you could possibly be. Just aim to be better than you were yesterday. You'll get there eventually. Thanks for listening, my friends. I love you.